Thank you, Seth. We uh, began our series last week in the book of Colossians with uh, verses 1 through 8. And um, in verse 3, Paul told the Colossians as he was greeting them that uh, he prays for them always. He and Timothy did that. And now in our passage this morning, verses 9 through 14, we learn what he prayed for them. We read, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Francis Bacon was an English philosopher and scientist who is credited with making the often quoted statement, knowledge is power. Most would agree with that. Knowledge has given us miracle drugs and opened up the vastness of the universe to us. But when it comes to the Christian life, knowledge is often undervalued and detached from practice. Theologians, after all, worry about angels dancing on pinheads while real people just want to know how to have a happy life. Doctrine is up in the clouds, often confusing and not much use for daily living. So you often hear catchy expressions like, doctrine divides, love unites, and deeds, not creeds. In fact, nothing could be farther from the truth. Separating knowledge from practice is what we could call a false dichotomy, which gives only two possibilities when, in fact, there may be a third and better possibility. For the Christian, there is, and it includes knowledge, doctrine. It is eminently practical. We see that in the prayer of Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. It contains very significant doctrine about God's grace and our lost condition, about our rescue from darkness and redemption from sin. This is what the apostle wanted the Colossians to know in order to be grateful, in order to persevere and to walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord. That's what he and Timothy prayed for them. They have said that they prayed for the Colossians always. And now in verse 9, they repeat the assurance of their constant prayers by amplifying on just what it is that they prayed. Very simply, it is that the Colossians might gain the knowledge of God and of his will that would help them live in a way that is fitting for his people, for God's people. That's the prayer in verses 9 and 10, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Knowing and walking, they go together. But before walking is always knowing. Francis Bacon was right. Knowledge is power. Doctrine is power. 
Creed and deeds go together. You can't do a task unless you know how to do it. And you can't walk well and in a worthy manner if you don't know where you're going or you don't know how or why you're going. Knowledge first. The knowledge here is of a specific kind. That's indicated in the, the word that Paul used for it. The typical Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. In fact, the background on the book of Colossians is sometimes explained as being in regard to an early heresy known as Gnosticism. You've probably heard of Gnosticism. It's from this word gnosis. And the idea of it was these were people who had special knowledge, secret knowledge. And uh, that's the basis of what Paul is saying here, the word that he's using here. Though this word is a little different. This is epinosis. It's prefixed with the Greek preposition epi, upon, to give this an intensive form. And the idea of this knowledge is that of precise knowledge. It is uh, not the knowledge that these false teachers were promising, esoteric knowledge of the, the stars and the planets and magic formulas that only the spiritually elite have and possess and would guide them into realms of light. This knowledge is real truth. This knowledge is divine revelation. And it's joined to spiritual wisdom. It, it is the knowledge that is the basis of true religion. Knowledge that starts with the right understanding and attitude toward God. It's what Solomon spoke of when he wrote in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And later, he wrote that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's what will lead to right behavior. And the knowledge that Paul wants them to have is the knowledge of Christ, who is the subject of this book of Colossians. The only path to real wisdom and a well-lived life is Christ. Believing in Him, trusting in Him is the fear of the Lord. And that trust in Him and knowledge of Him must grow. So Paul and Timothy both prayed that the Colossians would be filled with both the knowledge and the wisdom that comes from it. They wanted them to have a Christian mind. They wanted them to think in a Christian way. That's what they prayed for. Now ask yourself, is that what you pray for yourself and for others? I read an article years ago. It was uh, in a weekly magazine. I think it was Newsweek. And the title of the article was Talking to God, an Intimate Look at the Way We Pray. And according to the article, lots of people in America pray. They pray for a variety of things and in a, for a variety of reasons. And one is because it, it gives them inner peace. A cardiologist at Harvard Medical School recommended prayer for that reason. It is therapeutic. One man prayed for everything, and that's good. But he asked the Lord to repair his television because he didn't have enough money to do it. According to the survey, almost, a survey in this article, almost half of the people prayed for material things. That was their great concern. Now that was decades ago. Maybe things have changed, and I suspect if they've changed, it's probably for the worse. But Paul and Timothy prayed for knowledge and wisdom. I remember talking to Dr. Johnson many years ago, and... Um, uh, hearing him say on an occasion uh, that uh, as a young man, he, he prayed a simple prayer. Lord, give me an uncommon knowledge of your word. And God honored that prayer. He honored it 
by giving Dr. Johnson discipline and the, divide, uh, and the drive to, uh, to study the Bible. And, and, and it was that desire, interestingly, that moved him to give up golf. I was talking to him about that and, and uh, asked him why he had given up golf. And he said, to, this is something of a quote, there were other things I wanted to do more. Meaning, he had a greater desire to spend his Saturdays studying rather than being on the golf course. It wasn't a legalistic thing. It wasn't as though, well, I've got to do this to gain some merit. It was what he desired to do. God gave him that desire, and so he spent his time in study. God answers the prayer for greater knowledge, for an uncommon knowledge of the Word of God, for epinosis, the knowledge that Paul is speaking of here, precise knowledge of his word, and the wisdom that comes from that, he answers that in those who study and study hard. And those are the people who live well. That's the purpose of knowledge. Not knowledge for knowledge's sake, but knowledge for a fruitful life. Verse 10, so that... You will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The phrase, in a manner worthy of the Lord or worthy of God, is a phrase that uh, has been found in documents in the province of Asia where Colossae was, western Turkey. It was a phrase that was used by the pagans. And maybe Paul knew that this was one of their expressions, and he used it here to say, in effect, if pagans felt the importance of representing their gods well in their behavior, how much more should Christians live to the glory of the one true God? The Christian home ought to be an example to unbelievers. People ought to say, see how he loves his wife. The church ought to be a shining city on a hill. We ought to outlive secular society. I mean by that, we, we ought to live lives distinct from the world, better than the world, and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit that's given in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul mentions some of those virtues in the next verse, but what, what is noticeable, noticeable here is he says that living obediently to the Lord results in more knowledge, increasing in the knowledge of God. Knowledge and conduct go together. It is a false dichotomy to separate them as though Doers don't worry about doctrine and, and uh, splitting hairs, and people who are concerned about details of doctrine live apart. They live uh, up in ivory towers. They're completely uninvolved with life and its issues and people. That's not true. Knowledge, rightly understood, Properly applied, knowledge leads to action, and action in turn increases knowledge. It, it gives reality to knowledge. It expands the scope of our knowledge, the experience of it. To him who has, more will be given. The active, obedient life is where we see God at work in things, we see His hand in our lives. The things we learn about in the Word become all the more real to us in our experience as we learn them and act upon them in faith. We increase in our knowledge. Now all of this, knowing and walking, is not only a human activity. It is divinely enabled. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 11, Paul prays for that in the lives of these Colossians. He prays that they would be endowed with power to live the Christian life and prays for great power, which is according to the measure of God's glorious might. Well, that's quite a standard. 
that, that's boundless power. That's the power that raised Christ from the dead. There's no power greater than that. And we need it. The Christian life is beset with difficulties. So we need knowledge to understand the nature of things. We need wisdom to know how to apply our knowledge to the circumstances and situations of life. And we, we need endurance to continue on in and through the challenges that we face. That's specifically what Paul prayed for. Endurance that they would be able to stand firm in the face of trials and oppression, which they were facing. They were facing difficulties there in Colossae. He prayed that they would be strengthened for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Now that's not natural, having steadfastness and patience. It's, it's a work of God. It's the fruit of the Spirit that Paul speaks of in Galatians chapter 5. And because it's the fruit of the Spirit, he's saying it's a gift of God. It's a supernatural work of the Spirit in our life. And he's praying that for these Colossians. And it's what we are to pray for ourselves as well. Steadfastness and patience. Now, there are people who have shown courage under fire and determination. There were people in Paul's day who did that. The Stoics would do that. Stoicism was the leading philosophy among the ancient Romans. It was about endurance. It was about keeping a stiff upper lip, about fortitude and self-restraint and self-control, all good things. But F.F. F. Bruce asked, a stoic in the stocks would have borne the discomfort calmly and uncomplainingly, but would he at the same time have been heard singing hymns to God? That's what Paul and Silas did in the Philippian town jail after being severely beaten. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, at midnight they were singing hymns. And that's when the earth shook and the jail doors opened and God did a great miracle. The Stoic and the tough American can show self-resolve and self-sufficiency, which is admirable, but the Christian can not only endure hardship, he or she can do so joyfully. That's what God's power gives us. That's not what we draw up from ourselves with our own kind of self-resolve. That's a work of God. And yet, it is joy-producing power that works through our knowledge of God and what He's done for us. There is a lot we need to know in order to endure joyfully. And I don't want to be glib in talking about living joyfully through difficulties, because we don't always do that. Christians don't succeed in that all the time. It's, it is a great challenge to be joyful in the midst of hardship and sadness. But that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of work that occurs in us through knowledge. That's why knowledge is necessary. Knowledge is power. It truly is in the Christian life. And that's Paul's prayer in verse 12. Joy ends, verse 11, but, but better really connects with verse 12. Joyfully giving thanks to God the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. This is all about the response to God's goodness. Paul could have said, endure and obey. It's your duty and there's some truth in that. But he didn't. Instead, he reminded them of who they were and why they were who they were. It was all God's grace. He'd done wonderful things for them and would do wonderful things for them in the future. These old pagans were now new saints, holy ones, called out of darkness into light. These Gentiles who were in unbelief and without hope and without God in the world, 
now had God and hope. And God Almighty, the God of the universe, was their Father, Paul says. Imagine that. God who dwells in an approachable light, who no man can see and live, had brought them near and revealed himself to them. To them of all people. The God who created the universe out of nothing, before whom the nations are like a drop from a bucket and like dust upon his scales, who is the judge of all the earth and will judge it in righteousness, he is now their father. And as a father, he cared for them. All his power, his unlimited power and wisdom and love was directed to them for their good, for their eternal benefit. And so they had hope. The future for pagans was dark, but now they had the inheritance of the saints in light. Why? Why did they have that? Because they'd done some good thing? Because they pleased God in some way? No, they had all of that by sovereign grace. A free gift. God, Paul said, qualified them to be saints and share in the inheritance. God did it. They didn't do it. That's God's grace. And that should have given them confidence in life's struggles. Given them a reason for endurance and steadfastness in the struggle. And it, it should have given them, it should give us, by application, joy in their endurance. And with that joy, they should have been thankful. That's the right response to grace. Joy and thanksgiving. God qualified them to be saints and inherit eternal life and glory. In other words, He saved them. The future is secure. The present is safe. God is for us. And if God is for us, who is against us? That's Paul's question in Romans 8, verse 31. It's a rhetorical question. There are people that are against us, of course. Paul knew that. Paul experienced it. The Lord told us we can expect that. But who is against us of any consequence, of any duration? During the Reformation, people faced strong opposition and suffered greatly for it. There were five students who had been trained in Geneva, trained under John Calvin, citizens of Lyon, who went back to France to evangelize. They were caught and put through an inquisition, but under great pressure and threat of death, not one of them denied their faith. They went bravely to their deaths. On the way, they joyously sang the ninth psalm and then joyfully mounted the pile of wood and as they were tied to the stake, each one said to the other, May God keep you, my brother. As the flames went up, they were heard consoling each other, saying, Courage, brother, courage. Their biographer said, Thus died Calvinists. I like that. I'm a Calvinist. I hope I die like one. If I do, it will be for the same reason those five young men died so bravely and confidently. Knowledge. Doctrine. They had the knowledge of God's grace and faith in what God had gained for them and promised to them. They knew that they had the inheritance of the saints in light. And so they knew their trials were short and their future was eternal. It was all God's gift to them. They knew that and gave them endurance in trials and joy and thanksgiving in endurance. It has been said, and I think I've quoted this more than once from the, uh, 
the Scott Thomas Erskine, that uh, in Christianity, theology is grace and ethics is gratitude. Theology is great. Theology is grace and ethics is gratitude. Good behavior is the product of gratitude, not obligation. And gratitude is the response to grace, to God's goodness to us. We have so much to be grateful for. Even in the greatest trials of life, we're saints, we're God's holy ones by grace. And because we are, we have hope. We have certain hope. We have a glorious future. We need to know that. We need to understand that. That word light is full of meaning. The inheritance of the saints in light. Light is truth. Light is life. Nothing lives without light. Light is purity. And light is the glory of God. We now live in it. And to emphasize the great blessings we have now and, and will have to a far, far greater degree when we enter into that inheritance in light, Paul recalls their origin and by application our origin and the reason for the blessings. They were in darkness. Verse 13, darkness is about evil. Darkness is about error. When it's dark, so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face, you, 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 don't, you can't get your bearings. You're unsteady. You fall. There is confusion in darkness and deadness. Genesis 1 gives us that picture of the world in the beginning when it was covered in darkness. It was formless and void. It was cold and dead. Life on the surface of the earth cannot thrive in darkness. And that gives us a sense of what uh, spiritual condition, what spiritual darkness is. It, it is deadening. That's the, the mental and the moral world these Colossians were in. And you and I were originally in. Paul speaks of it here in verse 13 as the domain of darkness. The, the New International Version calls it the dominion of darkness. And the word used here means authority. It is power. It is... Uh, a power that has influence. And it's the word that Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that he was arrested. And he said to the police who came for him, those uh, soldiers, this is your hour and the dominion of darkness. They were under the direction of dark powers sinister forces that were against him, that were at war with him. And they were under the influence of those evil forces and they didn't really realize it. And that's life. There are evil forces in this world that we are a part of outside of Christ and don't even realize it. In Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Paul speaks of that. He speaks of the world rulers of this darkness. They are at work in this world and, and influence it for evil. It seems that in those places farthest removed from spiritual light, where darkness is greatest, life is cruelest. They are places of oppression where the powerless are under the heel of the powerful. There's moral confusion there which is unhealthy, that takes a toll physically and mentally. Paul speaks of immorality as a special sin against the body. The body is corrupted. Religion is no help. It compounds the problem. It is the darkness. The world religions are a great lie 
They are hopeless. They're brutal. They're pitiless. And you may think that sounds rather harsh. That, that priests, religious men would be cruel. In India, Amy Carmichael rescued young girls from the Hindu temple where they had been dedicated to the gods and to child prostitution. Think of that, children dedicated to that. That's man's religion. It is dark and cruel. The farther a society departs from the light of God's revelation, the deeper it goes into darkness, into error, into myth and lies, into depravity and perversion. The more ruthless and sad life is. That was the domain of darkness the Colossians were at one time a part of. It was Satan's domain. It is his domain. And, and they were all under Satan's dominion. They worshiped Jupiter, but they served the devil. Now that's John's witness at the end of his first epistle. First John ends with uh, or verse 19 of chapter 5 is, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And that presents quite a picture, quite an image, because the idea there seems to be that of a sleeping child in the arms of a monster. Now that, that's more than creepy, that's terrifying. And the heathen world is that. It, it, it is in that condition, all of the world is in unbelief. It's one of fear. Life in it is uncertain. It is, it is not hopeful. And lived in ignorance and superstition, it causes a, a dread of the future and of eternity. Darkness. Darkness now, darkness forever. But Paul reminds the Colossians, God rescued them. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Rescued us. Jew and Gentile alike were in unbelief and rescued out of the darkness. It takes different forms. And the only way out is by God's rescue. What a, what a wonderful, glorious place to be. Out of the arms of Satan and into the loving government of God and Christ His Son. He is the beloved Son, loved by His Father for His purity and His holiness. He's altogether good. There's no darkness in Him. And He cares for us. We have been transferred from darkness to light. And when you think of that, think of the, the great kings of the ancient world transferring conquered nations from their homelands to new lands. That's what the Assyrians did with the ten tribes of the north. They transferred them from Israel to Assyria. And what uh, Nebuchadnezzar did with uh, the, uh, the, the tribes of Judah and uh, Benjamin and Levi, he transferred them from there to Babylon. But this is that, but not a tragedy, but a blessing from a dark place to a glorious place. He's transferred us out of, of one domain into another. He's transferred us out of a corrupt and corrupting kingdom of darkness into a king, the kingdom of His victorious Son. There's nothing to fear there. The powers of darkness that kept the Colossians in error and ignorance, fear and dread have been vanquished by Christ. They're free of all of that. Now that is the present reality. We, we are in that domain of light and truth. We look forward to the inheritance with the saints in light, to a world without end. We look forward to that. But even now, we are in Christ's domain. We are now citizens of heaven. And the more we live in that citizenship, the more obediently we live to it, the, the more we know 
that we are of it. And not of this world, which is a fraud and which is passing away. We don't fit anymore. The course of our lives has changed. What what was once natural for us is now unnatural. What was once humorous now is inappropriate. Our tastes have changed. Our goals are different. We have new hearts. We have new lives and a new allegiance. We are under heaven's authority and heaven's protection. And the Lord, the the King, lets nothing touch us that is not according to His will and for our good. We need to know that and believe that. By the Holy Spirit, He guides us through life's dangers and pitfalls. He gives us wisdom. He makes His Word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And He empowers us spiritually to persevere. We need to know that. Now why is this? How could this this victory over the forces of darkness and the the transfer into the kingdom of Christ occur? Now after all, the false teachers had gnosis, they said. They had knowledge. Knowledge. They had secret formulas for salvation, just as today priests offer sacraments and ceremonies as the means of salvation. How is this that this transfer has taken place? Well, Paul doesn't explain it the way the Gnostics did or the way the sacerdotalists, the men of sacraments might explain it. He gives a different explanation in verse 14. The explanation is very simple. It's in that word redemption. In Christ, Paul says, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption is deliverance or release from captivity by means of a payment, a ransom. You find this very frequently in the Bible. It is being bought out of a situation of slavery or captivity. But what was the price paid? Well, Paul doesn't say that here, but he does in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 where he states that it is through His blood. That's the payment. God set forth His Son to be the agent of salvation by being our substitute in the judgment that we deserved. That sacrifice satisfied God's justice which obtained the forgiveness we receive by faith. Now, through faith in Him, we're free. Free from the penalty of sin and free from the power of sin. Now, not free from from challenges and hardship. We still struggle with sin. We always will in this life. As long as we're in the flesh, we're going to struggle with the principle of sin that's within our members. But we are truly an emancipated people. And as we walk by faith, live with the knowledge of God's grace and gift and promise of the future, we appropriate our liberty, we appropriate power, and we live the happiest of lives. We live the fullest of lives. Again, I don't mean we live carefree lives at all. We have trials and troubles, but in the midst of that, if we're living according to the knowledge that He imparts to us, we understand it and believe it. We have joy in the midst of all of that, and we live the fullest, most productive lives of anyone. There's a lot of theology in this prayer that Paul wanted the Colossians and wanted us to know and believe. We we can't walk well if we don't know it. It, that is the, the, the knowledge, the truth of God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We won't walk well If we don't have that lamp, if we don't have that light, if we don't have that knowledge, that doctrine, that truth. But to even begin on that walk, 
you must first believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who became a man and died for us. He's the Savior. And all who trust in Him are saved. He's the only way to life. All other paths are wrong. All other paths, all other ways are dead ends. Now that is not a false dichotomy. It is either grace or merit. It's either faith or works. The apostles and the prophets are clear. We are saved through faith alone in Christ alone. It is all by the sovereign grace of God. And the promise is that everyone who acts upon that, who by the grace of God believes in Jesus Christ, is received by Him at that very moment. Saved now, at that moment, and forever. If you've never believed in Him, trust in Him. And then claim these great promises of having this inheritance with the saints in light. And know that you're living in that light now. And as you gain more and more knowledge, you have more and more power to live a fuller and fuller life. May God help you to do that if you haven't. And if you have, may we all seek to know Him more and live a kind of life that is worthy of Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this great text of Scripture, this great prayer that Paul and Timothy prayed for the Colossians. So much in there. We don't have time to cover it all, really. We could preach so much more, teach so much more. We need to reflect upon that. But what's clear here, very clear, is we need the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His will, and we need to act upon it, live by faith. Help us to do that. And then we'll live to Your glory and we'll walk in a manner that's worthy of You. And we do that by Your grace, we pray. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.